to us to think about the subject of the Christian mind and to approach it in, in such a variety of different ways that I think is so very helpful. Um, we have been challenged to face the attacks on the Christian mind and have also been challenged to build up the Christian mind from the wonderful resources that are ours in Christ and in His Word. And uh, we have sought to do that, to defend the Christian mind and build up the Christian mind uh, by looking at theology, by looking at philosophy, by looking at science, by looking at worldview. And today I want to return to looking a little more at how history plays in uh, to that whole subject, uh, but I want to focus our attention uh, as we will look at some history around some themes that we find in Psalm 49. So if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Psalm 49. Uh, in my last address I referred to Jerome who um, confessed that he much preferred to read Cicero and Plautus, Plautus, uh, much preferred to read Cicero and Plautus to the Bible because the Bible was so crude, whereas Cicero was so eloquent. Well, I'm not sure Jerome took Psalm 49 adequately into account in that evaluation. I think Psalm 49 is one of the great poems of literature as well as being a remarkable revelation from God. So let me read for you Psalm 49 this morning. This is God's own Word. Hear this, all peoples. Give ear all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak wisdom. The meditation of my heart shall be understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will solve my riddle to the music of the lyre. Why should I fear in times of trouble when the iniquity of those who cheat me surrounds me, those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches? Truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life, for the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice, that he should live on forever and never see the pit. For he sees that even the wise die, the fool and the stupid alike must perish and leave their wealth to others. Their graves are their homes forever their dwelling places to all generations, though they called lands by their own names. Man in his pomp will not remain. He is like the beasts that perish. This is the path of those who have foolish confidence, yet after them people approve of their boasts. Like sheep they are appointed for Sheol. Death shall be their shepherd and the upright shall rule over them in the morning. Their form shall be consumed in Sheol with no place to dwell. But God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for He will receive me. Be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases, for when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. For though while he lives he counts himself blessed, and though you get praise when you do well for yourself, his soul will go to the generation of his fathers who will never again see light. Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beasts that perish. So far the reading of God's Word. Let's pray together. O oh Lord our God, we thank You for each day of life that You give us. We thank You for the remarkable measure of the good things of this world with which You have favored us. But most of all, we thank You for the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our life and our wisdom and our Good Shepherd. We are thankful, O oh Lord, that He has ransomed us from the grave. He has given us wisdom and understanding. He has promised us life here and now, but also life forever with You. 
And we pray, O Lord, as we labor to build within ourselves and within our churches, within our communities, within our world, a Christian mind, a mind of wisdom and of life and of light, that Your Holy Spirit will bless our enterprise, that Your Holy Spirit will bless our meeting together today, that You will bless each one of us, each one of our families, each one of our churches, that You may be glorified and the riches of Christ displayed before an impoverished world. Hear us and bless us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. The psalmist confesses at the beginning of this psalm that life is a riddle. And that's true in so many ways, isn't it? What is a riddle? It's a question asked to which the answer is not obvious or immediate. In fact, a riddle is a question asked that uh, is a bit of a trick question. And uh, there are many riddles in life. The psalmist in Psalm 49 is particularly focused on one riddle that recurs in the Psalter and recurs in the mind of the faithful, and that riddle is, why do the wicked prosper? If God is good and all-powerful, if He loves His people, if He promises to take care of His people, why do the wicked prosper? And that's a mystery in life in a number of ways. There are many mysteries in life. Why, why does the course of history run the way it does? Why do there seem to be times at which there is great response to the gospel and great blessing in the church and a great knowledge of Christ seems to be pervasive? And then other times when the truth of Christ seems to be shrinking and shrinking, when Christ seems more and more despised, when the world seems to be passing Christ by. And we're left with questions. Uh, when we look at the course of Western history in the last couple of centuries, we observe a, a steady decline in the presence and influence of Christianity. It's not probably actually true that there is a decline in the number of Christians. The case can probably be made that there are more Christians today around the world than there have ever been. God is still doing His work. God is doing remarkable work in Africa and in Asia and South America. But still there is a sense that the power of cultural formation of Christianity has significantly declined, that Christianity is no longer regarded as a serious, powerful thought form that has to be answered and dealt with. And for a number of centuries, other forms of thought seem to have become more and more powerful in the West, more influential in the West. They seem to be the future, we seem to be the past. Sometimes that can be discouraging. And as some feel that they live in a post-Christian world, and as they look often in a somewhat patronizing way at us, oh, you're a Christian. That must be nice for you. I wish I could believe that. But you know, I'm actually a thoughtful person. I've been to high school. <laughs> now come on, we've all had that once in a while. Maybe not in those exact words, but that just slightly patronizing attitude. And sometimes we brought it on ourselves. I remember when I was in college, a Christian friend had a bumper sticker that said, Jesus saves. And one of my post-Christian friends observed wryly, oh, at what bank? <laughs> and it was not a bad point. Sometimes we use language people can't understand, doesn't communicate. But there is this attitude that, that we have moved on to bigger and better things, and then the attitude that, well, you know, when you look back at the history of Christianity, 
Christians didn't do so well. Christians have a lot to answer for. The Crusades. Has anybody ever mentioned to you that Christians were crusaders, were guilty of taking up the sword in the name of Christ, and did terrible things? It's true. Ever heard of the Spanish Inquisition? Uh, Postmodern people seem sometimes not to know much about the Bible, less about theology, but they do have their list of Christian offenses in history. And the sad thing is, that list is often accurate. A commitment to Christ and to Christianity is not a commitment to defending all things people have done who call themselves Christians. And we perhaps have been rightly humbled as we've had to look back at our own occasional history of violence, more than occasional, our own times of arrogance, our own times of oppression, our own times of indifference to injustice. We do have things to answer for. And we should not for a moment run away from that. We are a religion that believes in sin. And I used to have a friend who said, uh, we Calvinists not only believe in total depravity, we practice our doctrine. (laughs) But I think there comes a time for some bold engagement with post-Christian thought as to how they've been doing historically. Not only how they've done philosophically, not only how they've done worldview-wise, if that's a word, not only how they've done scientifically, we need to do all those things, but how have their ideas worked out in history? Post-Christian ideas, how have they worked out in the modern history of the West? And I think it's time for Christians boldly, although thoughtfully, carefully, not too belligerently, but since it's only us today, I think I can be a little belligerent. How have their ideas worked out? What about that wonderful outcome of Hegelianism called communism? How did that work out? Communism was, of course, post-Christian. Communism recognized that there was no God, that religion was the opiate of the people, that religion was a way in which the elite suppressed poor people by getting them just to think about an afterlife, so they wouldn't think about how bad they have it in this life. And Marx said, if you get away, get away with the idea of God and organize life on scientific principles scientific economic principles that understand the science of the movement of history, you'll be able to get rid of oppression. You'll be able to have a genuinely just functioning society. We'll kill the capitalists, and the party will establish and move towards the dictatorship of the proletariat until we reach an everlasting utopia. And this is what a scientific study of economics and history will lead us to. How'd that work out? It's much worse than Margaret Thatcher's great line about socialism. You know the problem with socialism? You eventually run out of other people's money. No, 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 no. Now, what happened? What was the consequences of these ideas? Karl Marx sat sat in the reading room of the British Museum writing Das Kapital and doing science in his mind, and he convinced many intellectuals that this was the scientific wave of the future. He had understood the scientific principles of economics and history. Now, I want to be clear. I should should have said this earlier. I want to be clear. I am pro-science. 
Every Christian should be pro-science. We should not be science bashers. That's a form of anti-intellectualism. But we should be pro-careful, thoughtful, valid science. Marx, I'm sure, was perfectly sincere in his heart that he had discovered valid scientific, economic, and historical principles that would change the world and make the world better. He was sincere in thinking he would make the world better. And people followed him, followed him passionately. There were just some problems. It didn't work. It didn't work right from the beginning. Everyone who had studied Marx carefully was amazed that the communist revolution succeeded in Russia, contrary to all communist principles. The revolution was going to take place in industrialized capitalist societies where the proletariat had come to self-consciousness in light of their oppression and would rise up against their capitalist oppressors. It wasn't going to happen in an agrarian society like Russia. So right from the beginning, it wasn't working. It wasn't right. The science wasn't valid. Well, that's all right. It's not in the right place the right time, but nonetheless, it's a beginning. Let's move on to that utopia. How did that work out? Brother Joe, Joseph Stalin, our comrade, millions of Russians and Ukrainians starved as Stalin took foodstuffs from the farms to feed the cities and intended that millions of his own people should starve to death. Probably the greatest killer in the history of mankind, Joseph Stalin, in the name of a modern, postmodern, scientific, utopian ideal. We'll make the world better. We'll do it without God. What was Joseph Stalin? The psalmist knew, verse 14, like sheep they are appointed for Sheol, death shall be their shepherd. Joseph Stalin was a shepherd of death to millions of people in the name of post-Christian, scientific, utopian ideology. Stalin wasn't the only one. There was another scientific ideology, post-Christian ideology, it was going to build a Reich that would last a thousand years. Adolf Hitler and Nazism. Now, I don't want this quoted out of context. Adolf Hitler gets a bad rap. Now, don't quote that. <laughs> he gets a bad rap because Hitler is so terrible as we look at history that the only way most people can cope with thinking about Adolf Hitler is to say he was a monster or he was insane. That's not true. He was not a monster because he was human. And he was not insane, he had an ideology. He had a scientific ideology. He had a post-Christian, scientific, utopian ideology. And the ideology was this. Science has shown us that some races are superior to others. Science has shown us that the fittest should survive. Science has shown us that the weak should perish, that the strong might prosper. If there is no God, and fundamentally the Nazis didn't believe in God, they would tip their hat if they had to to placate some simple-minded Christians in Germany. Fundamentally, they didn't believe there was a God. They believed that 
might made right, and they were convinced by a bad science that Germans were a superior race and that they lived in a sea of inferior peoples whom they should overcome and who should give way to them that they might have room to live. And if there is no transcendent God, and if there is no transcendent morality, if Darwin was right, there is no design and there is no designer, there is no ultimate purpose, there is no ultimate morality, why shouldn't the strong have their own way? Why should they give way to the weak? From the inside, it was an ideology that made perfect sense. And Adolf Hitler led his followers to hell, both in this life and in the life to come. He was a shepherd of death. He, too, was responsible for the death of millions and millions and millions of people. Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler were not monsters. They were evil men who followed an evil ideology because they had rejected God and rejected His revelation and rejected His Christ. I think postmoderns who deny God ought to have to face intellectually what the denial of God has done in the last century of our Western history. We have to face our history as Christians and recognize candidly what is wrong with what has happened in our history. But we as Christians, I think, rightly can say that the offenses of Christians in history are from a misapplication of Christianity. It's because people have not really understood Jesus and His message and have not really followed Jesus and His message. That's why Christians did things wrong. But I think we have to press on the postmoderns. The question, did Stalin and Hitler really, fundamentally, fail to follow out the implications of a lot of modern thought? We heard yesterday that the new atheists are beginning to say there is no real moral responsibility. And of course, if there is no God, if there is no purpose to life, where would absolute moral responsibility come from? Then we are just animals. And what do animals do? The strong kill the weak. And then we all go down to death eventually anyway. The psalmist knew this at least 2,500 years ago. Verse 12, man in his pomp will not remain. He is like the beasts that perish. The psalmist says they may get rich. They may build beautiful palaces for themselves. They may name countries after themselves. But death is their shepherd. And they go down to death and they are remembered no more. I suspect if Jay Leno went jaywalking in Los Angeles, he could find any number of people on the street who've never heard of Stalin or of Hitler. And no, it's not just a California thing. Forgotten, the great powers of this world who made a name for themselves. But the Scripture calls us to something deeper and more profound. 
when we have, when we have critiqued these worldviews historically and said, where do they really lead? Now, you, I am not saying that every non-Christian is a communist or a Nazi. What I'm saying is that they, they remain moral people because they have borrowed from Christians a kind of morality for which they have no real foundation. And it becomes alarming as we think about the future. The Germans, many of them who followed Adolf Hitler, were amongst the better educated and more sophisticated people in Europe. But they allowed death to be their shepherd. And we have to think about that as Christians. We have to hold up that reality and, and say to the watching world, who will be your shepherd? What shepherd will you follow? There are really only two shepherds. There's the good shepherd, the shepherd of life. The shepherd who gives life in this world, gives morality in this world, gives coherence in this world, who has answers for the riddle of life in this world, who provides wisdom and understanding in this world, but also provides the promise of eternal life. Or will you follow the shepherd of death who leads down only to the grave? destruction, and forgottenness. And we have to press that truth in our time. But we also have to work out, <clears throat> we have to work at working out what that truth will actually mean. What vision of this life as well as the next life can Christians hold up as an alternative to postmodern thinking and postmodern experience and postmodern work. And this is an area where I think we as Christians have to commit to engaging more perhaps than we've done. I think we as Christians have done especially more recently, an increasingly good job of engaging theologically. We have wonderful resources to defend the Scriptures and their reliability and authority and to exposit the Scriptures for our people and for others. We have wonderful resources to think theologically, to think out the implications of what the Scriptures say, particularly for truth and for the life of individual Christians and for the life of the churches. All you need to do is go to the bookstore here and find amazing resources to help us think theologically. But when we move beyond the realm of theology and begin to think about other areas of this life, how are we doing in engagement. I had a woman come to us, and she said, I'd really like to come to your church. I said, oh, why is that? She said, well, a lot of reasons, but one is I don't hear a lot of politics from the pulpit. I said, well, I'm sort of glad to hear that. I don't think ministers particularly know much about politics, and uh, hopefully they know something about the Word of God and can talk about that. But they don't know a lot about politics. And she said, yeah, I get the feeling that in my church where we hear a fair bit of politics from the, from the pulpit, uh, about 98% of my church is Republican. And she said, I'm a Democrat, and I get tired of it. <laughs> I said, well, probably 99% of my church is Republican, but we don't talk about it from the pulpit. She said, I'm glad for that. But you know, the truth is, now, Hold on, I know it's early, and I, I don't want to shock you. Neither 
the Democratic Party nor the Republican Party cares about the cause of Christ. Now, American Constitution is set up so that uh, we are pretty much committed to a two-party system, at least in presidential elections. So I'm not here to appeal for a new Christian political party. But I am here to appeal for Christians to be smarter than they've been in terms of political engagement and not be used and to realize there's something fundamentally wrong when liberal Christians just go along with a liberal political philosophy and conservative Christians just go along with a conservative political philosophy. Christians ought to be asking, is there some unique witness we might bring to bear on this subject? And I'd like to talk just a little bit this morning about one of, in my judgment, most remarkable modern Christians who did some very serious thinking about this subject that I think can be provocative and informative for us, and that's Abraham Kuyper. Is it all right to talk about Abraham Kuyper here? R.C. said it's okay to talk about Abraham Kuyper. Now, I don't know if you know anything about Abraham Kuyper. I suspect some of you know a lot about Abraham Kuyper, some of you know a little about Abraham Kuyper, some of you know nothing about Abraham Kuyper. He's a friend of mine. He was born in 1837. So we've had a somewhat distant friendship. Um, but this is the way historians get to think. 1837, that's yesterday. He's a modern thinker. And part of what was fascinating about Abraham Kuyper was that he was one of the really profound Protestant thinkers who said, we no longer live in the Middle Ages. Have you ever noticed that the profoundest thoughts can often be reduced to a rather simple initial expression at least? Death is their shepherd. How profound is that, yet how simple? We do not live in the Middle Ages, Kuiper said. Profound, but simple. What he means by that is, we Christians are no longer in charge. We were in charge in the Middle Ages. It wasn't always great, but we were in charge. And if people weren't Christians, they kept their mouths shut or they were in serious trouble. We were in charge. And Kuiper said, we're not in charge anymore. And Kuiper was so radical, he said, it's even not so bad that we're not in charge anymore. The only way we stayed in charge was by use of the coercive power of the state, meaning we put people in prison or to death who didn't agree with us. Kuiper said, that wasn't Christian. It's a good thing we're not in charge. We didn't do such a great job. But the fundamental reality is we're not in charge, <clears throat> and we're not likely to be in charge. So how do we adjust to this new situation? How do we live in the modern world? How do we live in a world of competing ideas without withdrawing, without giving up? How do we continue to speak in this world? How do we allow Christianity to have a voice in this world without just trying to restore the old Christendom? Abraham Kuyper was a Dutchman. Now, I know all of you are Dutch or wish you were. Um, Abraham Kuyper was a Dutchman. His father was a minister. But in college, for a time, Kuyper pretty much lost his faith. He faced the liberalism, the postmodern thinking of his own time. <clears throat> but he came out of that. The process by which he came out of that began by realizing when he was in school, he heard a very learned professor lecture, and uh, this professor lectured on the Gospel of John, and the professor said the Gospel of John was written by the Apostle John and is an accurate reflection of what Jesus taught. 
And then a couple of years later, he heard that same professor lecture on the Gospel of John, and he said, the Gospel of John was not written by the Apostle John and is not a reliable guide to what Jesus taught. And Kuiper said, this is scientific theology? These are the experts I'm supposed to trust? And he became somewhat skeptical of the claims of experts, the claims of science in his day. And despite his skepticism, he became a minister. That's still true today. Being a skeptic doesn't necessarily keep you from being a minister. He became a minister, but in that first parish that he served, the first little church that he served, there were pious Calvinistic folk. And he was advised by some members of the church, don't pay any attention to those people. They're troublemakers. They're malcontents. They never liked the minister. But Kuiper was an idealistic young man, and he went to them, and he appealed to them, you know, why don't you, why don't you relate better to the church? Because the church doesn't teach us the Word of God. We have to stay at home and nourish our souls by reading the old writers. Well, Kuiper had done some history in, in school, and he was fascinated. What are, who are the old writers? Who are the old writers that you read? And he said, well, we just read pious old Dutch writers that are reliable in the Word of God. Oh, well, who are those? Well, reliable Dutch writers like John Owen. <laughs> These people had, amongst other things, Dutch translations of English Puritans, and these were such dear, common not very well-educated folk, they didn't even know that these weren't Dutch writers. They were Dutch enough to know that it must be that anything good comes from the Netherlands. <laughs> and, and Kuiper was so moved by the piety and, and faith and devotion of these people, it led to his conversion. And, and out of that came one of the core convictions of of Kuiper's whole thought and life that individuals have to be changed. That regeneration is one of the most important Christian concepts, not only for the individual but for our whole Christian way of thinking. Regeneration makes us new creatures in Christ. You may want to write that down, Abraham Kuiper. New creatures in Christ. It wasn't original to Abraham Kuyper. Amen. New creatures in Christ. We are different from what we were, and we are different from the old creatures of this world. We have a new mind, a different mind, as we have a new heart and a different heart. And that began to inform the way Kuyper thought about everything. And, and he began to become a, a theological voice for orthodoxy in the Netherlands. He began to stand up and say, our Calvinist forefathers got it right. What we find in our Reformed confessions and catechisms is right. It's the truth. It's what the Word of God says. It's what the world needs. It's what the church needs. It's what individuals need. And he set to work with an unbelievable amount of energy to try to see that that principle of regeneration would be expressed in individual hearts, but also in the ideas of Christian thinking and in the institutions of Christian experience. Now, did you get those three I's? I worked really hard on that. I don't want you to miss it. Individuals, ideas, and institutions. This is what Kuiper recognized as crucial to the formation of a Christian mind and a Christian influence. And his life became remarkable. He left the ministry to the disappointment of many to enter politics because he felt a Christian voice was needed there. And in the Netherlands at that time, one could not be a minister and serve in the parliament. And he went on to an extraordinary career. 
he went on to establish remarkable institutions. He established a daily Christian newspaper. Now imagine what America might be like if there was a reliable daily Christian newspaper commenting on subjects going on in this world. He established a weekly Christian devotional. It was called Table Talk. No, it was called, uh, <laughs> it was called The Herald, but it was a lot like Table Talk. He established a political party called the Anti-Revolutionary Party. We stand against the French Revolution, its Enlightenment ideals, its post-Christian ideology in the name of Reformation for Christ. And Kuyper succeeded for a time in becoming Prime Minister of the Netherlands. This was not just a fringe movement, just a, a splitter movement. It had great impact on the society. Now, I'm not suggesting that we can just copy him or that we can replicate what happened. He was the right person at the right time with extraordinary blessing from the hand of God. But he also labored in remarkable ways, became prime minister. He established a university. He said, we not only want popular thinking, as might be expressed by the political party, political thinking, but we need scientific inquiry. We need a university to carry that on. He established the Free University of Amsterdam, which became for a number of decades a bulwark of Calvinistic thinking. I think it's remarkable that R.C. Sproul's had the vision to establish Reformation Bible College because ideas need institutional legs to make an impact. And so we have these institutions. Kuiper very hesitantly and grievingly established a new denomination where Calvinist orthodoxy could flourish. He didn't want to leave the church he'd been raised in, but he came finally to the conclusion, we tried to rebuild, we couldn't do it, we must move out. And so you see this remarkable range of concerns. He established a Christian labor union. He helped encourage Christian day schools at the grammar school and high school level. He wanted to bring something of the witness of Christ to the whole society. And he did it on the basis of some very basic ideas. One of his ideas, we've already talked about the importance of the idea of new creatures in Christ. Another of his ideas was this. This world is abnormal. That's a very profound observation because the dominant post-Christian worldview that he confronted said this world is normal. If you're an evolutionist, this world is normal. It's just evolved. It's one thing after another. It's natural. Naturalism comes from natural. It's just natural. Death is natural. Death is normal. Injustice, inequality, oppression is normal. Don't be surprised, it's just normal. And Abraham Kuyper, in a powerful Christian witness, said, this is not normal. This is not the way God created. This is not what God intended for His creation. This is abnormal, and it's a result of sin and the fall. God did not create us to die. God did not create us to sin. God did not create us for injustice. These are all abnormal things against which we bear witness. It's a profound testimony. 
And then Kuiper said, and, and here I think is often a sign of, of great thinkers, when their words are almost prophetic. Kuiper would never have claimed to be a prophet, but his words were almost prophetic. He said, you know, the way modern thought is going, and he said this in about the 1880s and 1890s, the way modern thought is going, we are going to end up either with societies where the state becomes tyrannical and runs everything. This is pre-communism and pre-fascism. We're either going to end up with a state that is tyrannical and runs everything, or we're going to end up with societies in which the individual is a tyranny and destroys all institutions. I would submit to you that's prophetic. And that much of the 20th century was the great experiment in state tyranny, in state know-it-all, in state run-it-all, in state running over everyone who got in the way. And America runs the risk of the tyranny of the individual, where each one does what is right in his own eye with no restraint. And Kuiper said, how do you avoid? How do you avoid those directions in, in modern thought? He said, you, you avoid that by recognizing that God alone is sovereign. The state isn't sovereign. The individual isn't sovereign. God alone is sovereign. And God has established in His world areas of responsibility. Kuiper called them spheres. Areas of responsibility, and in each of those areas you are responsible only to God. The state has a responsibility for justice, and it's responsible to God for that. The family has a responsibility for love and raising children. It's responsible to God for that, not to the state. The church has a responsibility for faith. And it's responsible to God for that, not to the family or to the state. The university has a responsibility for knowledge. It's responsible to God for that, not to the state, not to the family, not to the church, but to God. And Kuiper said, only this way will we avoid societies that are tyrannical because we'll see that God alone is sovereign in His goodness, and each of us are accountable in our various relationships to Him for who we are and what we'll be. A powerful voice for the shepherd of life. Now, my contention is that not that Kuiper was right about everything, but Kuiper challenges us in profound ways to engagement Kuiper wrote a very interesting essay in uh, 1895 called Christ and the Needy. Christ and the Needy. I think it's an essay that'd make a lot of us uncomfortable, made me uncomfortable. This is what he wrote in part. It was only about 50 pages, I won't read it all. He wrote, financial power, climbing higher, collecting treasures in stocks and precious metals, purchasing houses and landed properties, becoming the master of earthly goods. This, it may safely be said, is the main thought that exercises the heads and hearts and senses nowadays at the stock exchange and in the world of our young people. Everything stalks money. Everything thirsts for money. Virtually all senses and thoughts are set on acquiring money. To gain control over money, people will use cunning and guile. They will cheat and deceive each other. They will risk the goods of their wives and children, and sometimes even the goods of strangers that have been entrusted to them. Everything is measured by money. Whoever is rich is a celebrated and honored man." He didn't even know Donald Trump. That's not actually in the essay. This is just what Jesus does not want. He sets Himself diametrically against it. He proclaims that a world or a people who aim at it and pursue it corrupt themselves spiritually in the process. 
storing up all kinds of treasures in order to heap fortune upon fortune and imitating the financial barons on a small scale, Jesus regards as cursed. It's a very powerful statement. He says, what is the Christian witness in this world? It will be loudest if we control, Kuiper said, our desires. Don't let the world and its marketing establish your desires. Don't become convinced that the piling up of money is the end of this life. The Christian witness, which he said neither the socialists nor the arch-conservatives understand, the Christian witness is for a just society, is a concern for the needy and the oppressed. Now, Kuiper said we can have different notions of how you express that concern and how you help the needy, but if you don't have any concern in your heart for the needy, how can you be a Christian, Kuiper said. He lost followers when he said that. But you see, he calls for a distinctively Christian way of thinking. And he said our concern for greater justice in this world is born out of our devotion to God and to Christ. God is the source of justice. Christ as the ransom for those who are caught up in the oppression of sin. And he said, we do not support greater justice in this world because it's an end in itself but it's part and parcel of our testimony to the importance of the next world. Why do we keep our desires under control here? Because this world is not our home. We're just passing through. We too go down to Sheol, but the shepherd of life does not leave us there. He has given the ransom to God for our lives. He has given us understanding that transcends this world. He has enabled us to live out of love for God and the neighbor in this world because we know there's another world yet to come. That's a Christian mind in action. That's a Christian mind confronting this world and offering an alternative to the shepherds of death by exalting the shepherd of life, the good shepherd, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has made us new creatures, who has renewed our minds, who has given us new values and new desires and new goals and calls us to raise up that message of Christ that will stand out in this world, that will show the love of Christ in this world, so that others will be drawn to faith in Christ. Ignorance is not bliss. Knowing Jesus Christ is bliss. Knowing Jesus Christ directs us for this life and assures us of eternal life because of the ransom that the shepherd of life paid to God for us. May God grant that every one of us here has that assurance, that confidence, and that joy to live not to mass or build a name for us in this world, but to be assured that we are not men in their pomp who will not remain, is like the beast that perishes. That's verse 12. But listen to the shift in the last verse, verse 20. Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beast that perishes. Jesus Christ gives us understanding. We are not beasts. We will not perish because we know the shepherd of life.
Let's pray together. O Lord our God, how we thank you for the Good Shepherd who gave his life for the sheep. And how we thank you that we are guaranteed a home forever that he has built. And how we pray that as we live in this world as new creatures, the love of Christ, the goodness of Christ, the truth of Christ would so shine through our lives that many would be drawn to him, that our poor, sad, fallen world would be helped by his truth, and in all things he would be glorified. Hear us, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank <clears throat> you.